Hello, I am Dr. Sherry Ann Charleston. I'm the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer here at Harvard, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our kickoff event for our Juneteenth Freedom Week series. This on Juneteenth book talk um, with Professor Annette Gordon-Reed um, has been co-hosted by the Office of Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging and the Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging Leadership Council. We are so thrilled to be hosting this university-wide event as part of this week-long series of Juneteenth at Harvard, which will commemorate the end of slavery across the nation by celebrating Black freedom, food, and family traditions. Now, um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's feature program um, with Professor Gordon Reed. Um, Professor Gordon Reed is an award-winning historian and author of a newly released book on Juneteenth. At Harvard University, she's the Carl M. Loeb University professor and a professor of history in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Her groundbreaking book, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings in American Controversy revealed that the nation's third president, Thomas Jefferson, had fathered the children of Sally Hemings, a woman he enslaved. The follow-up the follow -up chronicle, The Hemingses of Monticello, an American Family, earned Professor Gordon Reed a Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. Um, we are beyond thrilled to have an opportunity to talk with her about this new book. Um, and I'm going to ask you to stay on with us until the end to hear a special performance by artist Remka Nwana and how you might be able to hear how you might be able to receive a copy of the book on Juneteenth. That being said, um, I'm going to welcome um, Dr. Gordon Reed, Professor Reed, Gordon Reed. It's wonderful to have you. Professor Gordon Reed is fine, or Annette, as we're talking, that's fine. <laughs> I'm glad to be Power. here. Yes, it's, it's just wonderful. You know, I said this to you before, but I will say it again. Um, I love the book. Um, so many people have remarked how beautifully written it is um, and how revealing it is um, for so many of the challenges that we're facing uh, today as a country. And so um, we're beyond thrilled that you're here with us today. Glad to be here. So I want to start off for those of us who haven't had an opportunity to read the book yet, which everyone should, um, to hear a little bit about the process that you went through to, to write this. Um, okay. Juneteenth is at the center of the book, mm -hmm. um, even though the book is not just about Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. right. So similarly, it focuses centrally on Texas and Texas history, but it's not just about Texas. Okay. It's also about the history of the United States more broadly. So tell us a bit about your decision to write this book on Juneteenth in this way. Mm -hmm. and the, the process of interweaving your own story and that of your family throughout. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a bit of a departure from what I typically do. Uh, the Hemings is a Monticello is 800 page book with copious end notes and all <laughs> kinds of things. It had to be done. It's a big family over a long period of time. And mm -hmm. typically I'm writing books where I'm writing about other people and not as much about myself. If I make references to myself, it's in the introduction, and it's a limited sort of thing. But my editor, Bob Weil, has been after me for a number of years to write a book about Texas. And I had, we had in mind a big book about Texas, you know, to talk about the development of, of the history of slavery in Texas. I might mention my family, again, introduction as a way of you know, opening things up, but to have a generalized history of Texas. Um, last year, I did an essay for the New Yorker magazine about on Juneteenth, about my experiences as a child celebrating it, what the holiday meant. And that was very personal in an essay. And a, a, a year before that, I had done a review of five books about Texas, Texas history for not just Texas history, but the, the essays about Texas. Um, for the New York Review of Books. And so Texas has been on my mind for a couple of years. And while the pandemic was over after Harvard closed uh, for in-person instruction and we went virtual, I decided to stay in Manhattan. I typically commute between Manhattan and Cambridge, but I came back and I stayed in Manhattan and you know, finished out the, the, um, uh, the semester. And then after the essay appeared, we got the idea that I could expand on that. I could do something different. I could do a book about Texas, but not the big book, but something that would be small 
and something short and sort of accessible to wide ranges of people, different age groups and so forth. So I decided to break my, uh, the detachment that I usually have in writing um, history and write about my family, make it about Texas history, but give enough about my family to open things up and tell the story of Texas through talking about people and places and sort of returning to a style of writing that I thought I would be doing when I was young and I wanted to be a writer, I thought I would be doing this kind of writing. I didn't think of myself as a historian and I certainly never thought of myself as writing history just to talk to colleagues, <laughs> you know, just for the scholarly world. The purpose to me for being a writer was to speak to as large an audience as possible. And so I sat down to write this, this book, which is a series of essays uh, that focus on people and places in Texas and to talk about indigenous people, Indians, people of African descent, Anglo-Americans, Europeans, um, to talk about all Latino, Latino culture. Texas has all of this and has had all of this from the very, very beginning. It was not a place that became diverse over time. This is, it started out that way. And that's the thing that people don't know about Texas or don't think about Texas because it has been constructed, as I say in the book, as a white man. I mean, you think about the image of the cowboy and even though cowboys, there were black cowboys and people don't even know that, but the Hollywood version of Texas gives us a, um, I think a very restricted, very limited, limited view of the place. So my intention in writing this book was to get beyond that, was to present Texas a capacious and you know inclusive and inclusive not in the sense that you know sometimes that word sounds like people people take it as you're forcing something in that's not there no this has been there from the beginning it's always been that way and i wanted people to think of it that way so that's what it is to sort of working out some things talking about my family just enough i didn't want the book to be about me so my editor and I went back and forth on whether or not how many names I wanted to give in the book. But I mentioned my mother and my father. I don't name all of my relatives because I thought the more that I did that, the more it would be about me and, and my family. It's supposed to be there, but I wanted Texas to be the real focus of it. And so I sat down and started writing and uh, got it in on time. And here we are. Well, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And, um, you know, in so many ways, this book is about, um, it's about memory, but it's also about re-remembering. It's about disremembering things and the way that we recall them. And, you know, it's, it's fascinating because the thing that's so interesting is this way that you are re-remembering your own childhood um, and these moments. Um, and it's, it's fascinating because, you know, you often wonder, you tell us this story and I'll let you, I'll, I'll let you tell it, but you tell the story um, of integrating, you know, a school in the first grade and this, this very real moment of really being a part of making history mm -hmm. and you're, as you're retelling it and recounting it, um, it has to feel almost like an out-of-body experience because that's <laughs> certainly the way it comes across. Um, so, you know, so tell us about that, you know, tell us about that experience, that process, mm -hmm. um, growing up in, you know, segregated Conroe, Texas. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. Uh, while I was here holed up in the apartment because of pan the pandemic, only going out, you know, to Central, Central Park for exercise and, you know, walking around and so forth, I was cleaning out some boxes in our apartment and I found an essay that I had written about this. And I don't know when I wrote it, but it must've been years ago, judging from the looks of it, the type, you know, and so courier type, but it, it was old fashioned looking uh, document that I'd written a long time ago. And, you know, the facts are pretty much the same. I think I wrote better this time than, than then. I mean, I've developed, um, but what this indicates is that this has been something on my mind for a long time, even before I 
came to actually write about this because once you have children, once I had kids and they're in school, I was sort of thinking about, you know, would I do that? I mean, what would I want them to be in that situation? And I should tell people what, what happened. Um, I write about the fact that, you know, 10 years after Brown, my school district and districts across the South were fi- trying to find ways to get around Brown, about the, you know, desegregation of the schools. So they came up with uh, a freedom of choice plan. And those names always sound like they're good things. Well, freedom of choice. Oh, could, of course, you know, of who, course. Who, who could be against freedom of choice, right? right. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's great. So <laughs> what they really meant was that people would adhere to the traditions of the town. And the thinking was white parents would choose white schools and black parents would choose black schools. My parents, and my mother, I should say, was a teacher in Booker T. Washington, which was the black school, K through 12. Um, they decided that they would not make that choice. They would choose to send me to a white school and they chose to send me to Anderson Elementary School. And you know, they, this was a, an important decision in their lives. It was a decision that, well, had ramifications for me and the community and so forth. I understand that there was an understanding between my parents and um, you know, the newspaper, the local newspaper. I guess the media would be too grandiose. I mean, it was just one newspaper. Um, and the school district that we wouldn't make a big deal about it, that they wouldn't, I would not be escorted a la Ruby Bridges to school or other Little Rock Nine or the other people around the country because my experience is not singular. I mean, that there were other people who were in this position, uh, but we would not make a big deal about it. I would just go to school as if it were normal. And my father took me to school and dropped me off. Um, there was a bus that I probably could have taken, but I think that would have been a bit too much, <laughs> you know, yeah, risking, too, risking too much at that point. So he took me to school and again, and I, as a kid, I never, I didn't think about that. I mean, I, I rode the bus later on when integration came, we all rode buses, but looking back at this, I realized that, you know, my father is taking me to school because, you know, they weren't sure at the beginning what it would be like. So took me to school, uh, my first grade teacher, and we all know who remember our first grade teachers, the formative people in our lives, Mrs. Daughtry was wonderful um, to me. Uh, my second grade teacher, those are the two years that were sort of, I would say formative in this process, Mrs. Gilliland. Um, they were both fantastic to me. And I never, um, encouraging, supportive, I never thought that I was, you know, they were treating me any differently than anybody else. Um, and so I, I think maybe in addition to just being great people, uh, the fact that my mother, I wonder if the fact that my mother was a teacher may have contributed to how they saw me, you know, this is a fellow person in the, in the, the child of a fellow professional teacher. Um, but they were great and I loved school. I loved learning. I you know, like the whole process. I, this was, I say in the book, this was a, an era when people weren't as concerned about hurting children's feelings <laughs> and they, you know, visibly separated us out. You know, we had bluebirds and robins and, you know, swallows or whatever. I was a bluebird. I was a good reader and in the reading group and I was a good student. And they put, you know, if you, if you got all A's, you were put on the honor roll and they, ran the, the school honor roll in the local newspaper. So I would be in the newspaper and stuff. So I was a good student, I was easy for them. One of my relatives, um, a woman who, who was very close to my mother, my mother had lived with her when she went to, to high school, chose to go to high school in Houston and went out to Sackowitz, which was this really, really ritzy department store. It was the department store um, in Houston at the time and bought dresses and tights and all kinds of things. So I, you know, I mean, I had clothes, but she just kind of went overboard with it. Um, I could probably go to school and not, you know, for the whole semester and never missing out, you have to repeat an outfit. 
Um, so I had a sense that this was a big deal. And I had the support of my teachers. Some of the kids were nice and some of them were not nice, you know? Uh, so, or they would be nice and then something would come up and all of a sudden race, I mean, the basis of the, 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 uh, the taunt or the, or the, you know, the, the argument would turn to race. And sometimes I would, you know, I can recall going to, um, I'd see people out at a, at a store outside of the context of school people who had been friends to me wouldn't, would, were sort of frosty, would not be friendly mm -hmm. towards me in front of their parents. And so that, things like this, I think really made me think about, well, what is this all about? Why are people acting like this? You know, um, and, and I knew that, that they felt that if they, the only thing I could assume is that if they were friendly to me, their parents, would be critical of them. And, you know, no one wants to be disowned or, or, or rejected by your family. So a lot of this mm -hmm. stuff, you know, people might know what, the, my father would say this, said, your friends might know what the right thing is to do, but they're not gonna do it because their parents, because their families will not allow it. Their families will not take that without some sort of, you know, retaliation or rejection or whatever. So. It just struck me, the whole question of race, you know, came to me in a very, very full way when I was six, you know, six and seven years old. I think what's so fascinating about this is the way that you're, um, you're connecting this moment in your life and we're sort of going back in time and going forward in time and thinking about the way the threads of race and citizenship and meaning making for African Americans are sort of working their way through your own family story. And we mm -hmm. see it, you know, we see sort of in this, in this moment that you're allowing us to see um, the ways in which the, the precursing moment, right, mm -hmm. um, actually is formative and, and shaping the interactions that you're having as a six-year-old child. Yes. Um, and it's fascinating, right, because I think people so often think, Slavery is so long ago, mm -hmm. um, and your book connects it in a way that helps us to understand, no, actually, this is a very present past. Yes, very, very present past. I mean, you know, from that, I tell the story of, of Bob White in the book about a man who was accused of raping a white woman, and my, that my grandfather used to talk to me about, talk to us about when I was a little kid, and it wasn't until I was doing this book that I found out that that case you know, he was arrested. Um, the, the Texas Rangers would take him into the woods at night, tie him to a tree, and they beat him until he confessed. And uh, this case went all the way up to the Supreme Court, which I didn't know until I was working on this book. And I teach criminal procedure, and I talk about confessions and coerced confessions. And the case that I use for the beginning, the use of the due process clause, is Brown v. Mississippi. Right, and people think about Mississippi and slavery and bad racial stuff. They don't think about Texas, you know. Mm -hmm. And the irony is, here's this case that I learned about when I was eight or nine years old, that I just didn't, I didn't know that it had that procedural history. But my point in, in mentioning this now is that this case is 1940. We're talking my time in the mid uh, 1960s. That's not a long time. So, in, in, in this kid, and I should say. The, the punchline of all of this, I don't want to use the word punchline, it may, it may not be appropriate, but when they send the case back down, White is murdered in the court by the husband of the person, of the wife, whom uh, the woman whom he allegedly raped, shot in the back of the head, killed in front of the judge, the jury, Open spectators, door. everybody, and he's acquitted, you know, and everybody cheers. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, that's close from 1940 to the mid 1960s, some of those people were still alive. Mm -hmm. Their children were alive. If you think about the, the, the culture, the atmosphere, uh, or something like that could happen in a place, you know, in a town like that, in a small town like that, that's not forgotten. The memory of that, the cultural memory of that, the actual memory of that shapes people's understandings of things. So, you know, I, 
the culture that I grew up in, the society that I was in at first, when I went to Sattler's clinic, we, the blacks were in one, went in one entrance and whites went in another, had a you know, much more spacious room, good magazines and stuff, which I resented because uh, we didn't have as good a number of them. And, and this is why I'm a little kid. And, you know, it's not that far, we're not far away from all this kind of stuff. What happened to Bob White was a product of slavery, which created a racial hierarchy where the lives of white people were thought to be more valuable than the lives of black people. And you just, you can't get rid of that. You know, the law may change even, but the customs and the traditions, the cultural memory still remains and is something to be worked out that we have to face and really talk about and try to exercise to the extent that we can. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's perfectly said. It's, um, you know, I've often, I remember driving through, um, driving through the South years ago and I'm a, I'm a, I call myself an up Southerner. So originally <laughs> from my family is all from the South. Um, and, you know, having this real sense that nowhere was it more clear to me than on that drive that the Civil War was still being fought. Mm -hmm. um, in street names, in symbols, mm -hmm. in statutes, it's everywhere. And, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, other historians, David Blight has said, you know, once said, as long as we have a politics of race in America, we'll have a politics of civil war memory. Yeah. And, you know, I am, you know, I'm wondering, you know, do you, what are your thoughts on that? And how are we supposed to think about um, moving beyond um, this moment um, and perhaps reshaping a new racial politics? It's a daunting prospect. It's a daunting prospect because there are lots of people who want to hold on to the past, who see value in a racial hierarchy and derive satisfaction by attaching themselves to a notion of white supremacy that means that you know whether they accomplish anything or not they are superior people sort of using the the accomplishments of other people to make lay claim for themselves and getting status that way we saw we've seen over and over in the south that whites who are not necessarily in power felt powerful because of the racial hierarchy they got something out of having a world where black people were on the bottom because they could say no matter how far down they were, um, they were better than a black person. And that kind of psychic uh, need, which maybe economists don't, well, I guess behavioral economists know <laughs> that people aren't rational. You know, before most people say, well, this would cost them money. This is not profitable to do it. Wouldn't it be better? No, no, there are some things that are more important than money to people. And, this notion of status and what it means, that's what we really have to confront. And I don't have a magic answer to potion for this or any ready answer to it other than the only hope that we have is to confront it and to be truthful about it. And as I'm sure you know, there are lots of efforts right now to try to back away from that. You know, the legislation saying you can't talk about race or you can't talk about current events and you're they're trying to cut this the discussion off but it's a discussion that has to be there because it has to seep into the consciousnesses of people that these were serious issues that helped shape who we are and if we want to get beyond that we have to to confront the problem and to see the ways in which it shaped us and maybe and and try to go in a different direction to do things different so you know, people talk about truth and reconciliation, and I'm not the person to, I'm not the first one who's said this, but you have to have truth first. You don't just have reconciliation. <laughs> the truth has to be a part of it. And to just say, oh, let's all reconcile without admitting that wrongs were done to people and that those wrongs are not just one-offs. These are things that shaped cultures and shaped society. And so the truth has to be there and then we can have the reconciliation. You know, you, in the book, you invoke um, the, the other, another great Southerner, um, William Faulkner, 
um, and his famous phrase, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Mm -hmm. um, and, but when you, and you, when you do it, um, I think what you write is even more poignant, poignant and beautiful. Yeah. Um, you say, um, the past is dead, but like other formerly living things, echoes of the past remain, leaving their traces in the people and events of the present and the future. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, you know, I was reflecting back on January 6th mm -hmm. um, when we saw rioters force their way into the Capitol mm -hmm. um, to assault the democratic process. But we, you know, I think so many of us were struck by the images of um, people, of course, mounting a noose on the lawn, but carrying Confederate flags mm -hmm. inside the rotunda. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. and we saw this intertwining of this sort of virulent racism um, intertwined in this this history of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's just to me, it's sort of it's fascinating because I think what you're what what you're calling us to sort of see is Juneteenth being um, sort of marking an end, but also the beginning, but mm -hmm. perhaps also forcing us to reckon with this idea that there were many open racial wounds that were left over at the end of the Civil War. And here we are mm -hmm. um, still seeing the evidence of that. Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, and it, the past is not here anymore, but as I said, the echoes of them are there. And it's useful for me to talk about the echoes because it, suggests that things, some things have changed. So the idea that we're stuck in the past and we can like you're in some like science fiction thing where you're in a time loop and the same thing keeps happening over and over, there have been changes that that reformulation of that suggests to me that we do have a chance if we work in a concerted way to go in a different direction. And, and, and those echoes of the past, we can, we can know they're there, but we can resist them or maybe shift them to come up with, with a plan to be different, to, to have a, to chart a different course uh, for the future. But all of that is still there because we do have, as David was saying, we have race remains a, a central feature of, of American life, a central problem in American life. And we haven't figured out exactly how to tackle it. I mean, well, you know, in some ways we have to talk about it and to, to address the problems that it causes. Uh, you know, we have made some progress on that front, but it's still, it's an uphill battle, it, it appears. And from the things, the reactions that we were seeing in some states about teaching about this and talking about it indicates that there are some people, there's a great amount of pushback against the effort, which may suggest that it's, it's evidence of some success you know, that, that, you know, schools are very different from the kind of history that I learned. And I had great history teachers. It's just that there were some areas of, of history that we just didn't talk about. You know, we really didn't broach. And I know from um, some of the works that I've done at teachers institutes and other places where we help, you know, people prepare lesson plans and so forth. It's a different world out there and there's reaction to it. That's, the reason people think that they're making a difference. And so now we have a response to it. Mm -hmm. If we could stay on this point just a little bit, um, you know, you build in the, you know, a, again, in the book, you um, invoke um, W.E.B. Du Bois and souls of Black folk um, in this notion of double consciousness. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you sort of build off the, the, the phrase that one ever feels its two-ness, an American Negro, uh, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps them from being torn asunder. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you're using this notion of double consciousness to explain for Black Texans mm -hmm. and their sense of themselves and their place in Texas. And, you know, it's so, it's so similar to what we hear um, from Black Southerners mm -hmm. um, throughout the Confederacy, and you, you note that in the book. Mm -hmm. um, two things. The first, it sort of reminded me, I, re I remember I was getting ready to go to graduate school and I was applying to be a Southern historian. Mm -hmm. And, but I wanted to study Black Southerners. Mm -hmm. And I had been working with Barbara Fields and we, she had told me this whole story about like, 
protesting in what was, I, it wasn't Barnes and Noble, it was some other book, uh-huh. store, but now Noble is the only bookstore that I have in my room ever. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, about her own book, wanting it to do Southern history, but this mm-hmm. idea that you're writing about black people. Um, no, you're not writing about Southerners, you're writing about black people. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, this sort of, um, this the way that you're encouraging us to rethink Southern history, I think mm-hmm. it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. And in doing so, um, you know, I think you give us a little bit of hope, both in this work and I think also in your other work, that the histories of Black people, Indigenous people, Mexican people can fit within the broader narratives of U.S. history. Um, along with all of our myths and our legends, but you caution us that this comes at a cost. Yeah. So I, I, I would love for you to talk to us about what we gain when we do this work, but then what we lose or what we have to give up um, if we remember the past as it is rather than as we wish it to be. Well, um, what you gain is greater access to what happened. <laughs> to the truth of the past. I mean, I don't really see any point. I mean, the exciting thing to me about being a historian and research, I love research. I love writing, but I love research as well, is finding out things from the archive, finding out things about the past that I didn't know. So many times I, I go into uh, a, a uh, uh, start a project and I have some idea about what I think, the, how things worked. Right. And I'm sure, you know, I mean, it's you, you look and you look and you think, oh, this is how it works. And then you find out, no, <laughs> that's not how it works. And, and whatever work you've done, you have to, you have to tear it up and go back and start again. I mean, it's the excitement of discovery. If I have my own ideas about what I want these people to do, which I could form before I even went to the library, and just know the general contours of their lives, I could come up with something that I could write it. It might even be really popular, but it wouldn't be what happened. It wouldn't be close to, we'll never know exactly what happened, but it wouldn't be close to that because I'm letting my needs and my desires, you know, push me in a direction that I want to go. That's comforting to me. One of the things that I, I noticed when I was working on my first book, and my first book really was about the way historians, mainstream, mainly white historians, wrote about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. The story is that their use of evidence, I noticed, was essentially skipping over reasonable inferences, the most reasonable inferences from an event until they got to something that was comforting to them, right? You know, it was the, the normal thing, you know, he was their father. That's why all of these things that are happening, all of these anonymous, uh, anomalous things that are happening snapped right into the place. If you say he was their father and that's why this happened. That's why they're named this way. That's why they're the only group of siblings who are freed. That's why they're, you know, on and on and on. And they just kind of bounced over those until they got to something that was comfortable to them. And people can do that in many, and, and you know, with many subject matters. And it's a tendency that we all have. And that's what historians have to check this to say, you know, why am I pausing over this? You know, why am I resisting this particular answer when it's, I, it keeps coming up over and over and over again that this is the most reasonable answer to this problem. So by looking at the past, not through what we want it to be, uh, but through the way it is, it's the only way we have any hope of improving ourselves, getting us uh, ourselves out of the, posi- uh, of the uh, predicament we're in, understanding the nature of it, uh, hiding that, which is what I-, I gather some of these legislative initiatives are trying to do, It's just a recipe for ignorance. It's a recipe for delaying the time when we can actually begin to work on and solve the problems that we have. No, I think so well said. So we're gonna end on a um, a note, sort of where we started with um, Juneteenth 
Mm -hmm. And in, you know, you, you mentioned forgiving the rest of us for, you know, taking Juneteenth <laughs> and it now becoming a national holiday. And I will say this begrudgingly, my stepfather was from Austin. When he first moved to Detroit, he said, you all don't celebrate Juneteenth. And then he chided us for not knowing our history as a true Texan, you know, he, <laughs> you know, he, 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 he criticized us for celebrating the 4th of July and not Juneteenth. I mean, we got a whole history lesson. So that's, funny. A, that's such a Texas thing to do. It is. It is. Impose your will on the, no, on the other people. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm, so I'm going to take it from you, not from him. Why should we be celebrating Juneteenth and thinking about, you know, the, its importance? Well, I think that there ought to be a day to remember, to commemorate the feeling that those people had when they heard this story. And I think it's when they heard that slavery was over in Texas. Now, slavery is not over until the 13th Amendment is ratified, December 31st, 1865. Um, but Granger was able to go to, Granger went to Galveston to make this pronouncement in the largest state in the Union because the Confederate Army, the Army of the Trans-Mississippi had kept fighting after, even after Lee surrendered. And this, so this was made possible by the defeat, the final defeat of the, of the surrender of the Confederate Army, the effort to, the armed effort to maintain the Southern way of life, which was of course slavery. So I think that this was a, a, a sort of a step, a, 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 uh, a marker of progress not just for black Texans, but in world history, a human rights um, victory in a way. And I think we should, we should celebrate that. Now, there are other candidates, December 31st, January 1st, the Emancipation Proclamation, but even saying those days explains why they're problematic. 31st and January already have major holidays <laughs> that people aren't gonna give up um, because of, you know, that this, and now we're going to celebrate New Year's Day, you know, Haitian Independence Day, New Year's Eve, all of this stuff on Kwanzaa on one day. Um, June 19th, it, none of these things are perfect, but June 19th, I think because it's summer, it is a holiday for the family. It's a holiday for community get togethers. I think practically, it argues for it being a national holiday. And I think morally to commemorate this thing that I mentioned before, a human rights victory. So what if it's not, if it was just in Texas, but the idea of the end of the armed struggle to maintain slavery, that this comes after that to me personally is, is important and people like it, you know? I mean, Juneteenth, it's a cool word and it's just taken off in the last couple of years in ways that I could not have imagined. And I think a lot of it last year had to do with, with George Floyd and thinking about race and the sort of national reckoning on race. And then we have this holiday that gives us an opportunity to talk about it. So I think, you know, we're on, you know, all but about three or four states celebrate it. We're on the path in that direction. And I, I think it would make sense to go ahead and make it a national holiday. Yeah, I think that we are, you know, we're certainly at that place now where maybe 2021 is the year um, where we can finally um, at least start to at least start to think about um, the possibility that we're, we're turning a new turning a new leaf. Mm -hmm. um, so settle. So rapid fire, settle a couple more debates for me. You how do you celebrate Juneteenth mm -hmm. and what is barbecue? Okay, what is June? Uh, what is what, how, do how, do I, how do I celebrate? How do you celebrate June oh, June? now you know I I can't barbecue myself <laughs> because I live in an apartment, uh, but I do drink red drinks, which is you're supposed to do. Uh, we do have watermelon. Red is I'm told this may be something that's grafted onto the holiday, but the idea was that it was supposed to be symbolic of blood bloodshed in slavery. I I don't know if that's just been put onto this holiday, but red has been a part of it from the very very beginning. What is barbecue? What do you mean? Do you mean it's something other than pork barbecue? 
Well, our, you know, every every region has their own thing. Brisket. And as no, a, oh, I see what you say, brisket. I like see, ribs too. I like ribs too, but I like barbe barbecue brisket in Texas is a big deal because of beef. It, it, it really is. But, you know, I was sharing with some friends earlier that, you know, I lived in Wisconsin for 14 years. People would invite me to a barbecue and they'd only have brats. And so I had to throw my own parties because I had to help people understand that you needed every animal that could be sacrificed. Ah, sacrifice. the table. So ribs, pulled pork, brisket, the, chicken, turkey, yeah, yeah. and salmon for good measure. Anything could be there. I mean, I know there's some people who are purists who say barbecue is only pork. Now, North, people from North Carolina say that. That's not right. Barbecue <laughs> can be beef. And barbecue brisket and links, you know, links can be barbecued. Anything, chicken can be barbecued. I, I'm for the works. It's the process. It's not just the meat. It's the the process of barbecuing. Well, and my grandfather gonna, had a barbecue pit, so he was an expert at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're gonna have a talk um, later on with a, a food historian who's gonna walk us through the the history of barbecue. Mm -hmm. um, I want to give you the last word, and um, you end the book on a note that I love, which is love. Mm -hmm. um, and you talk about, I think you give Texas um, in the final essay, um, it's almost a love letter to your home state. You mm -hmm. talk about, you say that love doesn't require taking an uncritical stance mm -hmm. toward the object of one's affection. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is so powerful, especially as we're thinking about, um, you know, we're both serving on the rename, on renaming efforts and, and thinking about our, our own um, love of place. Mm -hmm. So, Tell us about your love of Texas and, and we'll end on that note. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do make this point that, you know, saying that you love a person or a place, but, and insisting that everything they do is right and that you don't see the flaws uh, is to my mind, self-indulgent. It, it's not real love. It's like parents who have kids and the kids are always right. You know, the teacher is always wrong or the other kids are wrong. That's, that's self-indulgent. A love requires being critical because you want people and places to be better. And I say, how you do it matters. You know, you don't just say anything to your kid. You don't just say anything to loved ones and, and say, well, I'm just trying to make you better. You're not, you're not cruel in doing this, but you have a genuine care and concern about improvement of ourselves, not being too hard on ourselves and not being hard on others, but being realistic about ourselves. That's the only way we can, we can get better. And, you know, that's, and I love Texas because of the experiences that I had there, my mother and my father and my brothers, my family, you know, just because there are people out there who were unkind or people who don't even think that I am a Texan or an American, that's their understanding of things. My understanding, my Texas is my family, my friends, my community, and the people that I knew Form those formative experiences that taught me to love by having people who love me. And that's, that was important. And that's why I love it. Well, thank you so much. Um, and that this has just been absolutely fantastic and um, such an enjoyable time. And so we're just very grateful that uh, you would take time with us. Um, so we are going to let um, um, those who have joined us know how to get copies of the book um, and encourage you to do so. And we are giving away several copies of the book um, as well, because we think that it's important that it gets in everybody's hands. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Be safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. To receive your copy of On Juneteenth by Professor Gordon Reed, all registrants will receive an email on how to request or purchase from your local Black-owned bookstore. And now, please join us in welcoming artist and poet Remka Nwana, who will recite her original poem in celebration of Juneteenth at Harvard. Remka is a Harvard College student concentrating in economics and chairs on the Black Student Association, as well as manages the acapella group Key Change, honoring the music of the diaspora. Please welcome this rising star, Remka. Hi, my name is Remka and I will be reciting a poem that I wrote. It's called, To Be Black in America is to Be a Superhero. 
school. When I was a kid, I was introduced to superheroes. And of course, you probably know them too. Those characters with abilities so out of this world that it struck me as a little girl to believe they could never be real. Those characters that could overcome the wildest adversity such that there was a certainty that they could never be real. Those characters with strengths at length, inconceived and unbelieved, so to me, they can never be real. But as I've grown up, I've started to change my beliefs, started to gauge how fake superheroes really may be. And even though it's common consensus to say that they are fiction, I like to challenge common sense today with my diction. The world must have superheroes. The way people are thrust into injustice but stay strong, now that's a toughness that only the supernatural could possess. I mean to progress while oppressed, also leave a legacy and have success, that can attest to the fact that superheroes are real. The world must have superheroes. Systems are constructed just for lives to be destructed. I mean, for 500 years, a whole race was abducted. Peace always disrupted because bullies like Jim Crow find ways to interrupt it. A world this corrupted can only be survived if it has superheroes. People may call me crazy for saying this, but that's okay. This recognition isn't for them. It's for the ones that saved the day. To my black brothers and sisters, you are superheroes. And I can tell by your supernatural strength. You possess the ability to stay calm, cool, and collected despite being unprotected in the places you live. They've tried to break your spirit, shoot you down because your power, they fear it. But you stand strong amidst this. To my black brothers and sisters, you affirm that superheroes are real. To my black brothers and sisters, you are superheroes. And I can see it through your supernatural strength. To be promised a life of freedom and then to exercise it, to only have your life taken away when you're exercising, those are the fears that you have to deal with every day, but you're still smiling, you're still thriving, proudly walking the halls of universities that you were once denied in. To my black brothers and sisters, you affirm that superheroes are real. To my black mothers and fathers, you are superheroes. And I can see it through your supernatural strength. You bring children into this world through love, knowing that someone can take them out through hate. But still, you don't hesitate to let them fly free with the strong values that you instilled in them to see. To my black mothers and fathers, you affirm that superheroes are real. And then to the black grandmothers and grandfathers, you too are superheroes and I can tell by your supernatural legacy. To be told that you can't do it but push through it, you defied, refused to comply just to secure rights for our lives. And although today we still fight, we have come a long way because of your heroic sacrifice. So to my black grandmothers and grandfathers, you affirm that superheroes are real. Although it may you, it doesn't surprise me that the books we read misled us to believe that superheroes aren't real. The white man wrote his story as history such that the historical record doesn't record black superpowers. On this Juneteenth, let us not only celebrate freedom, but also call for the liberation of all things Black, including our stories. And then maybe with that, you'll finally be able to see, in fact, we do live amongst superheroes. <laughs>